Today's forum is about the conflict in the Middle East, and it's not according to the New York Times. And we're going to start with Stephen Zunas, who is a professor of politics and international studies at the University of San Francisco, where he served as founding director of the program in Miss Middle Eastern Studies. He served as a senior policy analyst for foreign policy in focus project of the Institute of Policy Studies and an associate editor of Peace Review and a contributing editor of Tikkun. He's the author of hundreds of articles for scholarly and general readership on Middle Eastern politics, US foreign policy, international terrorism, nuclear non-proliferation, strategic nonviolent action, and human rights. And you've probably heard him many times on the radio. He's the author of Tinderbox, U.S. Middle East Policy and the Roots of Terrorism, Common Courage Press. Um, and he's co-author with Jacob Mundy of Western Sahara War, Nationalism and Conflict Irresolution. Um, and here we go, Stephen Zunis. Thank you so much. Um, and obviously, this is the, the horror that's been unfolding the last three months has been um, really hard for those of us who've been working on the, on the Palestinian cause uh, over the years and decades. But it's also heartening to see the outpouring of opposition and mobilization in the United States and around the world, including for many of our comrades and colleagues who didn't really do much on Palestine before, but now recognize its importance and centrality and have been out in the streets with us. And um, so I'm glad to see you all here because we can, we can never uh, become too educated on this. And um, I wanted to just address a couple issues that I thought would be of particular importance for a group of, 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 of fellow leftists who are, you know, already have sympathy to the Palestinian cause, because I think this information would would help us thinking strategically and how we uh, can better uh, organize and try to change U.S. policy. I want to start off with the observation that uh, unlike some struggles we've been involved with over the years, those of us supporting a, a ceasefire. Uh, and uh, are in the majority. Polls show 68% of Americans support a ceasefire, including 80% of Democrats. The Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Anglican Church, virtually every mainline Protestant nomination have come out for a ceasefire. Only the right-wing fundamentalists support continued war. And Frank, just a little aside here, I, I find it rather upsetting. I mean, liberals will be totally freaked out if Biden sided with the fundamentalists on LGBTQ issues or abortion rights or whatever, but he can side with them on war and peace. And not just on this, on, on Iraq as well, where we have a similar uh, configuration and he, he's coasting for a renomination, but I'll put that aside for now. Uh, also, uh, overwhelming majority of academics specializing in the Middle East, including um, very mainstream international relations scholars. We've heard about the dissent memos in the State Department, uh, walkouts of, of staffers on Capitol Hill protesting their bosses' support uh, for the war. Even White House staffers walked out, had a vigil a couple weeks ago. I've never seen this kind of active dissent in Washington, D.C. on any foreign po policy issue. This is, this is really un un unprecedented. Among 18 to 30-year-olds, 72% oppose Biden's policies on Gaza. That is more than we saw in that age group in opposition of Bush's policy in Iraq, Reagan's policy in Central America, and Nixon's policies on Vietnam. This is an unprecedented level of um, dissent. Um, and yet, you know, Biden seems to be coasting to you know, re-nomination. And it is, we're here, I mean, I, we, I think of the analogy, and some of us are old enough to, enough to remember being around in January 1968, uh, and uh, you know Johnson was running for re-election, and you know, I think you know, but you know, I, I, it's, but we we don't have a Eugene McCarthy, we don't have a Robert Kennedy, or at least a sane one, um, and uh, we uh, and and. Um, <clears throat> And I, and, and I think it just really underscores, uh, uh, you know, what many of us have had issues with about, about the, the, the fundamental failures of the electoral system in this country. 
that you have that, that, that there's not a realistic alternative on the presidential level to those which support such a horrendous uh, policy that is opposed by the vast majority of the American public. And similarly to the Congress, uh, we are s seeing some important dissident voices on Capitol Hill, but they're very much a mi minority. All the, 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 the uh, not, not just virtually every Republican, but virtually the entire Democratic leadership um, is supporting Netanyahu and Biden on this. And again, not representative, not, re not, not representative of the, uh, again, the vast majority of Democrats. I've rarely seen such a huge disassociation between public opinion and the leadership of the Democratic Party. Uh, we, I've seen a lot of them, but this is one of the worst. <laughs> um, the United States is even more isolated in the inter international community. I mean, you, uh, uh, Biden has used the veto power three times uh, in the past three months and severely and threatened it other times to, to, to leave the Security Council virtually without uh, uh, ability to, to act. Um, and we have, um, and in the UN General Assembly, we're one of only 10 dissenting votes calling for a ceasefire, the others being Israel several Pacific Island states that are totally dependent on the U.S. economically, and a few right-wing uh, populist governments like Hungary. I mean, that, that was it. So we're very much isolated in, in the international community, again, even more so than we were on Iraq, on Central America, or Vietnam. Well, not surprisingly, we are seeing unprecedented resistance on college campuses and elsewhere. Again, this is very heartening. We're also seeing a, 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 a near, nearly at precedent level, at least the, over the past um, 60 years, in terms of a political repression. I mean, I, I was in grad school during the BDS campaign on South Africa, and you know, I was arrested multiple times. Trout charges were always dropped. Um, you know, they, 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 whereas nowadays, people doing sit-ins are facing very serious criminal uh, uh, offenses. Uh, similarly, um, we didn't have our films or our speakers uh, canceled and censored by administrations. We're seeing this, you know, it, it, you know, across the country. And we're not talking about hardcore pro-Hamas types. We're talking about Jewish progressives. We're talking about pacifists. We're talking about liberals who just support international law, and they're canceling their talks um, as well. And uh, we had Central America group solidarity groups, uh, um, South Africa solidarity groups. We weren't banned, but sure, be, they're be, they're being banned now. Even Jewish-led groups. I mean, you have to really go back to the mid-60s to see this kind of repression. Also, the anti-BDS laws that we're seeing. I mean, just for example, um, you know, that, that, that you have to sign a statement that you won't boycott Israel if you, uh, if you want to get a, 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 um, if you want to, if a newspaper wants to accept an ad from a community college or other state institution, if you want, if you're going to be a guest speaker somewhere. I mean, I can't, for example, if the University of Arkansas wanted me to come in, I have to say sign something that says I don't boycott Israel in order to get my airfare covered, much less an honorarium, as a way of keeping, you know, left speakers out of their college campuses, basically. And the Supreme Court has upheld that law. Um, and um, the, the, uh, it, and, and, and here's, here's the kicker. They define Israel as Israel or territories controlled by Israel. So even if you don't support, even if you don't endorse the BDS call, you simply don't think you don't want to buy from, you know, you want to boycott Caterpillar or Motorola or Hewlett Packard, those that are directly supporting the occupation, that counts as total BDS. And in several states have divested from their stock from Unilever because Ben and Jerry's, which is owned by Unilever, um, even though they um, sell their ice cream in Israel, make their ice cream in Israel, they refuse to, to do so in the settlement. So therefore, psh, they're punished for doing so. Um, and again, we didn't see this around the South Africa divestment campaign. Um, and when I think about this repression of anti-war voices, it concerns, it, 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 is this a trial run for war with Iran or war with Venezuela? I mean, I think they're really checking to see how far they can go. And this is, uh, this is why it's particularly important. We need to, uh, to fight back. Now, they can get away with this because of these charges of anti-Semitism. And I don't need to tell this audience about how anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. Anti, anti um, but it, 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 it makes it more difficult, the fact that Israel is the only Jewish state. When I think of times that I've had talks canceled at the last moment, or saying, oh, you can speak, but you have to be followed by a pro-Israel speaker afterwards. The people making those decisions were not right-wing Zionists. These were liberals. 
who heard from their Jewish friends that I was anti-Semitic or whatever. And they were saying, you know, and, 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 you know, there's a sense that, um, and, and you know how liberals, leftists, for good reason, if we hear somebody saying something's racist, or a black person saying something's racist, or a woman saying something sexist, we give them, we, 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 we uh, assume that well, they should know. You know, who am I as a white male to say to, to, to uh, a, a black person, that's not, you know, you're wrong, that's a racist, or a woman say you're wrong, that it's sexist. And I think a lot of liberals see that with Jews who say that Israel, that, that criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a thing, part of money. I don't, I don't think money is really, uh, in a few cases maybe, but I really don't think it's the financial thing as much as I think people really sincerely believe these good middle-aged liberals, you know, uh, who, who really do, uh, who, who don't realize that the, the weaponization of anti-Semitism to justify a highly um, you know, repressive right-wing uh, government. Um, now, when we fighting when fighting back against these McCarthyist attacks, let's not fall into a crying wolf phenomenon of not taking seriously when anti-Semitism does raise its ugly head within our ranks. It does happen. Um, not nearly the frequency that people claim, but let's not pretend it isn't there. Um, and I'll just give you an example. Obviously, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, but using the term Zionism in the same way anti-Semites have used uh, have used Jew Jews, such as alleging the Zionists control the banks, the Zionists control the government, the Zionists control the media. And again, that's just uh, rehashing the old anti-Semitic uh, canards. You'll find far more Episcopalians and Presbyterians who are a smaller percentage of the population than Jews far more disproportionately represented in the ranks of government, the media, the banks, um, they're, they're, you know, they're fi finance, you know, then you'll find Jews. Similarly, it's not anti-Semitic to call out the bullying of APAC and other powerful Zionist groups. But let's not pretend U.S. policy would be fundamentally different if they weren't around. I mean, we'd if it weren't for the lobby, we'd have probably have more Democratic allies in Congress. It'd probably be less censorship. It would be more it, more balanced media coverage. You know, it, it would be helpful in our struggle. But would there be a fundamental change in our, our our policy? I mean, does anybody think the U.S. government would be promoting a policy towards Israel and Palestine consistent with human rights and international law, nonviolent conflict resolution? And when have we had that policy anywhere else in the world? I mean, the U.S. supports the Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara. We support Indonesia's occupation of East Timor. We support South Africa, apartheid South Africa's occupation of Namibia. It wasn't a domestic lobby that made us do this. In recent, in recent years, we had South, we supported Saudi Arabia slaughtering tens of thousands of Yemenis and their bombing with the US Air Force refueling the fighter planes and helping with target selections. Okay, it was not, Gaza is not unique. And we could go to the death squads in Central America. We could think of, I mean, we could go down the list. You know, that, that let us not scapegoat Jews or Zionists and, and ignore the fact that U.S. imperialism is the root of the problem here. It's U.S. imperialism and militarism and the crisis of late capitalism. These are the issues. This, this is what's underlying. And the, the way anti-Semitism actually often works is they'll find a subset of the, rule, of, of the ruling class and, and target that instead of the overall overall uh, system. I've actually talked to Arab foreign ministers and deputy foreign ministers, and I say, why are you still friendly? A uh, half dozen of them. I literally, half dozen Arab foreign ministers and deputy foreign ministers I've spoken with personally. And I've said, why are you still so friendly with the U.S., given what we're doing with the Palestinians? And each and every one of them said, oh, your, your ambassador, your State Department guy said, the Jews really run U.S. foreign policy, and it's not your, your fault. You know, the classic anti-Semitic scapegoating. Let's not allow that to, to happen. So again, yeah, again, I, I, I protested when APAC is met in, in San Francisco. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not ignorant about their, 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 their clout and how they made things more difficult. But again, let's. This is about imperialism. This is not about some powerful minority group or whatever. And we really need to um, um, recognize that. Um, how's my time? Okay. Let me talk briefly about Hamas. Um, I was the first person to write an article about the rise of extremist Islamist currents, reactionary Islamic currents within the Palestinian movement. This was back in 1982. I was 25 years old after my first visit to Gaza. I saw how the, how the uh, Israelis, and to an extent the United States, was actually encouraging this as a counter 
to the um, uh, the largely secular nationalist um, uh, PLO, which includes some leftist uh, uh, elements in its ranks. And uh, Hamas was, well, had a support of less than 15% of the Palestinian population at the time of the Oslo Accords. And they were saying, hey, look, you guys are suckers to trust the United States and Israel will give a viable two-state solution here. And when, when and uh, the, 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 the settlements continuing to expand, the U.S. continues to support Israel no matter what. The Palestine Authority essentially becoming jailers in their own prison. More and more people supported Hamas um, until the 2006 uh, parliamentary elections. They got 44 percent of the vote. Um, they end up being able to seize a majority of the parliament, though the more moderate Palestinians were still in the executive branch. The Bush administration freaked out. They pushed uh, the Fatah to stage a coup against Hamas. Uh, Hamas got wind of it. They had a three-day civil war. When the smoke cleared, Fatah uh, had control of the uh, cities in the uh, West Bank, and Hamas seized control of the Gaza Strip. You know, several articles I've written some about. Vanity Fair had a very detailed article about this whole debacle. In other words, if the U.S. had not intervened, Hamas would have never taken control of Gaza, and the whole, this whole tragedy would not have been happening, seeing with the, pre, the previous wars. And, uh, and to, to, to mention something about um, their, their rule, they really are pretty reactionary. They've suppressed uh, leftist groups. They've suppressed the teachers' unions. They've suppressed other, other things. And I want to so I want to under, under, under just, just say w w one thing really. Um, uh, briefly, that I think uh, we need to consider when talking about Hamas, they aren't just a violent manifestation of the national liberation movement. They really, they really are a pretty uh, nasty reactionary um, fun, uh, uh, Islamist group, which is in many ways hijacked the the struggle. And those we, uh, we should be steadfast in supporting the Palestinian struggle. Let's not make apologies for them. And this is a big dilemma I think a lot of us on the left are taking right now. When most of us were coming to age, the leading challenges to Western imperialism were progressive. Some of them were a little more too militaristic and authoritarian for, for some of us, but by and large, there's no question who the good guys were in Vietnam and Central America and Southern Africa and elsewhere. Nowadays, a large portion of the anti-imperialists is being led by reactionaries, Salafist Islamist groups, you know, like Hamas, not to mention Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Um, or, or, or the Iranian uh, <clears throat> regime and its allies, or Putin, or you know, you can go down the uh, you go go down the list. That the um, that we the, the, and and we need to be cognizant of that. This does not mean we should challenge imperialism any less. It does not mean we shouldn't point out how U.S. policies have given rise to these reactionary forces. But let's let's not deny the nature of some of these groups here. And so, I, I, finally, I want to I want to give some hope. We we have it looks like a lot of us have been around enough to see victories on Vietnam, Central America, even East Timor, South Africa, elsewhere. That we can win this one too, I believe. And the big hope I have is in young people. I have never. You know, I am a political scientist. I have not seen any. In, except with the possible exception of LGBTQ issues, I have never seen an issue where age and political attitude parallel people as, as dramatically as I do um, uh, Israel and Palestine. It's quite remarkable. I've been teaching Middle East politics you know, for um, 35 years, and oh my God, <laughs> what, what a difference. I, mean, I had to bend over backwards to make sure people understood the Palestinian narrative you know, when I came in. If anything, it's the other way around nowadays. And there's several reasons for this. One is the young people today are much more diverse, many more people of color, and they recognize, and including a larger population of, of Muslims and Arab Americans, um, but they identify very much with the, the, the Palestinian struggle. Some in our generation, even some people on the left, saw Zionism as a national liberation movement for an oppressed people. Yes, they did nasty things, but, you know, nationalist revolution comes before socialist revolution. So, you know, people were willing to give Zionism some slack. This younger generation of leftists, nah, -uh, no, they see it as colonial settlerism, uh, and you know, with, with the idea, with the, the you know, and getting the consciousness people have of indigenous rights, and like again, it fits fits in uh, very much, um, uh, you know, with that. And you know, a lot of us, our generations, you know, thought the kibbutzim were really cool, these wonderful idealistic socialist uh, cooperatives, and etc. Younger people saying, yeah, but it's on stolen land, you know. <laughs> 
Um, and you, you go go down the list. This is the, 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 the attitudes are very, very different now. The guilt from the, the from the, the horror of the Holocaust is a, is a couple generations back now. Uh, the more overt forms of anti-Semitism, which are still pretty rampant in the 40s, 50s, 60s, are less visible now. And so I think there's a um so so I, I think we now, you know, we, we have a whole different approach to the to the conflict as well as a skepticism about war and intervention that emerged from the tragedy in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, so here's, here's the hope that, that these young people are going to be in power someday. You know, and I, I think we'll see a very, very, very different policy. The question is, how long is it gonna be and how many people are gonna die first? And that's why we need to keep on mobilizing, keep on organizing and realizing that we will win. Thank you.